All right, uh, testing, testing. Woo hee! You can tell it's a professional video clip in the opening words. Testing, testing. All right, so look, I'm sitting back in my comfy position now. I am using a Bluetooth microphone into a modern phone. In this case, it's a Motorola, I think it's an Edge 30. Uh, might be a pro product, might have a nice little camera in it. But uh, look, the reason I'm using an external camera and not capturing internally, that there will be reasons, they might become evident. Uh, and and let, let me begin, because <laughs> I know if I haven't got your attention in the first minute, ah, you're moving on to another video. That's fine. My videos are hopefully educatory, but also hopefully uh, social. So we, we might talk things at a slower pace. If you'd like to imagine me as the, the techie that comes around, and instead of just zooming around your desktop, clicking a thousand things and not telling you what I'm doing, and then just telling you it's fixed, we're working on the adage of teach a person to fish. So you'll find that when I zoom around the system, I like to uh, I like to show what's going on or show things to maybe be aware of, right? So that, that you can do the best by your machine. Now, if this video had a topic, it should have two parts to that topic. It should be 4K gaming, is it, is it viable? And I guess the, the, the context to that is on console, should we expect 4K at 60 frames a second or something? People seem to want 60 and they, they seem to think that if they can't get 4K at 60, that, that they're being ripped off one way or the other. So we might talk about that in a moment. There's no free lunch. And that, that what, what do we give up in order to try and make a console target 4K 60? <laughs> oh, as a PC user, oh my Lord, don't, don't want the consoles targeting 4K 60. But uh, puts, all, puts all the effort on the development team to come up with settings on a PC that might somehow make use of many, many, many times more hardware capability than what the consoles have for their entry level price points. You know, for high quality gaming, they can inarguably reach cheap for what you get. But when we buy into PC, we can argue we're buying into an experience. We can argue all sorts of things. Oh, sorry, I, sh I should confirm. So, so one of the things will be 4K gaming. And the other thing will be um, possibly tuning an AMD graphics card. Uh, and, and also an, an AMD chipset, possibly something like the Extreme I think it's the extreme, is it the Z1 or the X1? Found the, the new little Asus ROG. Uh, it's, it's an upstep on the six series chipsets. It's the seven series chipset at the moment. It's only showing about 20% performance increase, 25% increase over the generation before it. I think they were suggesting it would be 50%. But uh, the, the new BIOS is starting to roll out, I think, which is they're allowing the CPU core control. By lowering your CPU cores used, you can use a little bit more of the battery power over the GPU, and therefore you can ramp your frame rates up and probably you'll start seeing the 40% increase over the generation before it in uh, graphic intensive games. But uh, I'd like to talk about that a little bit. So we are gonna talk about optimizing, optimizing games um, in, in the, the middle part of the video uh, or possibly towards the end. I'll try to keep it fairly short, but I guess you the viewer are more aware of how long this runs. You can just move your mouse around and look, oh, look, look, you talked for seven hours. You must have left it recording, oh dear. Yeah, look, look, I'd like to do that. I'd like to just leave gameplay footage at the end and uh, have, have a short, tight and controlled message up until then. At this point, you're gonna be thinking, no, there's nothing about this that's short and tight and controlled. And so um, I'm gonna to wanna to come in in a moment. We're gonna just like talk about, about the settings and whatnot. Look, it's, it's all sort of irrelevant. Uh, you might have seen some screen tearing there. Uh, that is where my, my overdraw on the screen is such that I'm drawing it so quick and that the frames are either ahead or, or behind and then we're seeing the screen tearing which draws half a frame and then draws the next one. And that's, that's good for programmers where they want the, the fastest readout of the, the frame rate to the screen. It uh, can be good for benchmark testing, can be good for a range of things. And I have ways of controlling that when I'm gaming. Uh, but look, I can see that my phone recording screen at the moment is very dark. Right? So I calibrated it for the HDR on the other screen. And uh, to me, it looks like I've taken it too far. Maybe I shouldn't be gaming at night time, eh? Uh, but I'll see if I can get something a little bit prettier up on the screen. Okay, so conceptually, 4K graphics. Um, it's a very hard number to hit. It's a very, very high resolution. And we can argue it doesn't really give us a lot. And if somebody has been optimizing their PC games since the 90s, I've managed to get Deus Ex running at about one frame every 30 seconds when it came out. But I was also one of the people playing Crisis at ultra settings on release on a mid-range graphics card. 
I've met a couple of professional people who run overclockers clubs and stuff, and people who know their PC hardware. And whilst the whole world was denouncing that crisis wouldn't run and you couldn't run ultra settings, those of in the, in the know who actually know how to tune these things were quite happily running ultra settings. But we did the tricks, the tricks we've always known about, which is we simply just dropped the resolution. Right? You don't need to run a game at 4K resolution. And it's actually, re resolution is something you turn up when you've got frame rate to burn. So a part of this video is going to be learning what, what is frame rate to burn. Okay, well, hopefully my numbers are at the bottom of your screen, but I'll, I'll read them out just in case they're not. At the moment it's showing my power consumption at 200 watts, right? So this is a heavy draw moment. I'm at 99%. And I've tuned this graphics card to consume about 200 watts when fully loaded, about, about 220, 240, arguably it can peak up to. Um, but out of the box, they're meant to run at about 250. And they'll quite happily, you can tweak them up to about 320. Um, and if you're really hardcore and you're overclocking, you'll, you'll push them up to even towards 350. Uh, but out of the box, mine was quite happy to run it at 280 watts. So if I'm only running at 200 watts, I mean, that's a 40% reduction in power going into my card. Okay, why would we want to do that? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment when we talk about overclocking chipsets and keeping them cool so you can get more speed out of them. Um, what I'm trying to do right now is talking about loading, right? About, okay, so when I run up here and just look out at a field, I should be sitting at about 50 or 60% CPU, um, video card use, right? Here we go. So now I'm sitting at exactly that. GPU utilization is hovering between Look, you can argue it's 30 and 70, but the average seems to be around about 50. Yeah, it's pretty spot on. GPU power consumption is now down at 120 watts. And it's 40% less than I was, I was running at just a moment ago when I was running at 100% GPU utilised. So I've created a scenario where my video card is just sipping power when it's rendering easy to render screens. But if I then find an area in the game and uh, please ignore this area. It's just a bit broken. I don't think uh, the game is meant to run this way. It's, there's a whole bunch, of, a handful of spots in the game where you can just drop the frame rate. And uh, this is one of them. So 99% used. That is my, my video card is now 100% used. I'm consuming about 230 watts of power. My temperature is ramping up. In fact, my fan has just become slightly audible. But it's actually staying on top of the temperature. And it can brute force that moment there. But let's look at a regular heavy load in the game. I don't get stuck on corners of buildings. And this is an open world game. Open worlds are the hardest genre to do. Hogwarts Legacy is one of the prettiest open world games that's ever been made. Uh, I don't necessarily, not, not everybody understands the difference between an open world game and an instance game. And so I can run Greedfall or other, other you could argue, almost open world RPGs at absolutely paltry settings and just sit power in a totally different way compared to what a true open world game is. But even your open world games, your Kingdom Come Deliverance, your, your Witcher, which is arguably instance, it's not totally open world. Skyrim is, uh, you, can, you can just keep walking, keep walking. If you run your open cities mod, you can walk in and out of towns. Uh, admittedly, it's, it's more than 10 years old, that game. Um, but we're running open world games at ultra settings. And all these people claiming that, that they can't run at 4K at their screen resolution, that the game's broken. <laughs> That's not the case. Open world's very hard to render. Uh, case in point here, I'm sitting 190 watts, so a little bit down from max. My GPU utilization is just down from max. Uh, and the reason I've cast Lumen, or the, the light spell on the wand, is that the, the, the light mass across the screen generally ups that GPU utilization just a little bit. Now, I used to sit at 100% on the screen, but I actually ended up overclocking my video card. And so now I don't quite sit at 100% in this zone, which is a little bit sad, but uh, my GPU hotspot doesn't go exceed 94. Um, which means I am sitting at the full speed that my GPU clock is saying, about 2300 megahertz. Uh, but all my numbers are different to your numbers. So don't worry too much about my numbers. We want to talk about the theory, right? And the theory is, is that 4K can be very hard to render. But once we move past the need to do resolution, it really comes down to graphic settings and how much of your video card is being used at any point. So for context, the video card in the machine we're looking at right now has well, by a spec sheet, by box sheet, it's 24 teraflops of performance. Now, that's almost a meaningless indication of performance, MIPS score, like we used to have. Uh, a raw teraflop doesn't necessarily mean anything. I can give you the example of the difference between a PlayStation 5 and an Xbox Series X. 
are using what many consider to be the same chipset, but it's, it's not true at all. The, the Sony has consistently customised the, the silicon in their consoles or used very, very clever silicon designs. It actually makes it very hard for them to then emulate those chipsets uh, with later designs. And a classic example is that the CPU that was in the PS3 uh, was su such a supercomputer, they couldn't even sell them. And the PS2s too, I think, were almost considered a supercomputer on launch. That, that you couldn't sell them into Korea or something. Now, governments are afraid they'd be used for missile guidance systems. But to say that you can't really render a supercomputer on a lower powered computer, right? In order to emulate something, you need to have that much speed plus more in order to emulate it. And therefore a PS4 had a weaker CPU than a PS3, arguably. And um, for, for rural grunt, the graphics card in a PS4, much better, right? And yeah, I don't deny that the graphics were improved with the PS4. Graphics were, yes, but in terms of CPU, the capabilities of the PS3 was pretty incredible. And it, it really wasn't feasible to emulate that on a PS4. But now the PS5 has such a high powered CPU, they, Sony can finally emulate all these custom chips they've implemented over the years. So they can do backwards compatibility, first time ever. Whereas Microsoft have always used just basically standard CPU architecture. It's very easy to emulate the generation before it when you've increased the speed of the processor that you were basically using. So. It's not anti-consumer when Sony hasn't been delivering uh, backwards compatibility, but it's not the point of my dialogue right now. Uh, we're talking about customization of chipsets. And so what we consider is in the Xbox is what's called RDNA. It's made by AMD and that's what they call the architecture. It's the RDNA 2 architecture. And so the Xbox has what we call full RDNA 2. That is to say that, that what AMD had ready at the time when they were building RDNA was the RDNA 2 package. And Microsoft have used mismatch memory speeds throughout the console. That's the reason why we haven't got Divinity Original Sin 3, sorry, Baldur's Gate 3 coming to Xbox at the moment. It's for the couch co-op multiplayer, the mismatch memory speeds is causing an issue on the Xbox Series S. So they don't want to hoodwink it in later. It's a shame because Baldur's Gate didn't launch with multiplayer back in the 90s when it came out. It came out about a week later in a patch and you could actually then play multiplayer. But if, it, if the game doesn't launch with it, you don't have to support the feature, right? So if they just allowed Xbox Series S to play the game in single player, and then maybe added that feature down the track, that'd be fantastic. But uh, there'd probably be a, a, a downgrade in graphics and then people would complain. So I think Larian have probably done the right thing with holding back a software title. But uh, I'm sidetracking, sorry. As I say, I like to talk. And this stuff's all kind of relevant. Some of this stuff is relevant to the industry. And uh, the viewer base that come to, to maybe listen to me talk are probably just as interested in the opinion of an, of an educate computing user who's been servicing the industry for many decades as they are in possible support or uh, tips that might come along, which are probably applicable to everyone in my audience. So RDNA 2 was what was ready to go, but RDNA not 2, not full fat 2 that we find in the PlayStation 5 was because Sony went to industry partners, places like Epic Games who were working on the Unreal Engine 5 and said, well, what do you need from us in terms of customizing the CPU to allow you to do awesome tricks? And Epic had input, right? We've got, ah, oh, look, in terms of feedback physics and all the things that we'll be able to do with the, ah, the, ah, oh, oh, just brilliant, brilliant. But essentially what it was, was that they, they took a lot of the design also that was coming to RDNA 3, where there was gonna be a 50% performance increase per, per watt, arguably, or it was gonna be essentially the math was going to be almost 50% more effective at rendering stuff. And it was, that's kind of what they've got with the RDNA, not full fat two, that's in the PlayStation 5. And it, essentially it's, it's one of its biggest tricks is it just does an early Z cull and just anything that's not going to be rendered to the screen because it's sitting behind other objects, i.e. a wall and um, complex foliage even on the other, on the other side of a tree. All that stuff just doesn't go down the pipeline. It doesn't have to have ray tracing applied. It doesn't have to, it, it, it makes such a big, big difference. It's probably to the point of being about 40% speed boost. And that's essentially what we see in all the early generation PS5 titles is that when they should be running about 20% slower, if we just looked at raw teraflop numbers of 10 in the PlayStation 5 versus 12 in the Xbox Series X, we would estimate that the PlayStation should be about 20% slower. Here's the problem is that the Xbox was, to, to hit that magic number of 12 teraflops, it was a case of um, 
sales by numbers, right? They know consumers all being white belt consumers or yellow belt consumers. We know that bigger numbers must mean better. And so they, they used mismatch memory bus speeds through the console. They did whatever they could so that when you multiply all those numbers together to generate your teraflop number, it would look really impressive. But in terms of optimizing games to run in an ecosystem that can make use and, and put out 12 teraflops of power, it's a nightmare. And outside of Turn 10, who have become maverick games, they're, they're probably now a studio designed for gimping the entire rest of the industry down to Xbox level quality, uh, including PCs. That's the big drama of, of a Windows gaming system. Um, is, so that's what we're working with. So today, probably a lot of the solution will be, well, other videos I do will probably be working around Windows issues with regards to gaming. But uh, yeah, 10 teraflops in, an X, in a PlayStation 5, it's there about 40% more effective in the, in the real world. And so all the early titles, if we counted the numbers as being worth 12 teraflops and 14 teraflops in the, in, in the PlayStation, because it's got about a 40% uptick over 10 teraflops, it's actual raw performance that can be measured. Um, the games were consistently 15 to 20% quicker in, in bog down scenes on the PlayStation and, and Digital Foundry who are very much in the Xbox camp just refuse to acknowledge it, refuse to see it. Uh, I, I get a lot of, I stopped going to their webpage and leaving comments. I couldn't educate anybody. Every, everybody wants to believe that the Xbox is more powerful. That's fine. Um, it isn't. It's generic hardware and, it, it's, and it's owned by Microsoft. Oh my Lord. Um, anyway, the, the Sony, Sony 10 teraflops is actually pretty amazing. So. Why do, do I bring in any of that stuff into the equation? Well, as I said, I'm running 24 teraflops and it is RDNA 2. I opted not for RDNA 3. I opted for RDNA 2 because it is what is in the consoles. Arguably, it is what uh, the Xbox games that I won't be able to run on my PlayStation will technically be looking for. And so as a PC gamer, that's what I wanted to have as an ace up my sleeve to handle games that might not come to my platform of choice um, that I could uh, be able to play. So. 24 teraflops, I mean, that's technically double what the Xbox Series X has. And that's what my card is sold as in the box. Now, if I've upclocked the memory and upclocked the core speed, I'm actually getting more than 24 teraflops. Okay, so that's more than double. Now, I'm not playing this big numbers game to try and wow anyone. I'm just gonna set some expectations. Okay, let's just assume that the Xbox is 12 teraflops and that games make use of it all. Let's just assume my PC is only 24 teraflops. That means I'm basically double on the dot. So anywhere where I can bust out 4K graphics at 60 frames a second, I would expect an Xbox with half as much grunt to do 4K graphics with 30 frames a second. Now that does seem to be the target in quite a few games that are targeting 4K. The reality is they need dynamic resolution. That's the best they're gonna do. And I'll give the case in point, when I flew from the other side of Hogwarts Castle, past the castle and to where we are now, the actual usage on my video card varied a lot. And I'm only running, get this, oh my Lord, prepare yourselves, 30 frames a second. And I'm running 25% less than 4K resolution. So, what chance does a console have of rendering 4K with pretty graphics? Okay, so this is where the middle part of my video will come to tuning your games. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Your video card has as much performance as your video card has. How you choose to use its power is entirely your choice. If you wanna run at half resolution of what you can, achieve, can run at, you will quite literally get double your frame rates at that resolution. Now, that's not entirely true if, you, if your frame rates are being held back by your CPU, but that's, let's, let's sort of argue semantics right there. Let's, let's just work off the raw performance, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. Your video card can only do what it can do. And if you want to target 4K at 60 frames a second, you're going to have an ugly looking game. Or you can have about eight times the detail in your game. You can have everything, like more characters walking around, assuming that you don't need more CPU to render them. Um, you can have more lighting, more everything. You can just burden it down. You can absolutely make it amazing if you're willing to drop your resolution a little bit. And that's what these new techniques that are coming to PC, the things like DLSS, the things like FSR, these are methods that they don't render the graphics at 4K. And that's actually why you'll find I'm not using FSR right now. FSR2 in my case. And the reason I'm not using it 
is it'll actually be running at a lower resolution than 1600, right, which is down by 25% from 4K. So I find I get higher level graphics. So I'm just brute forcing the game, sure. I'm rendering it. It's, it's pretty pretty. I've turned off ray tracing shadows because they're broken in the game at the moment. They cause a lot of graphical issues in certain areas. And that was just a patch that happened to the game. Um, oh, March 9th or something. And they, they just, they because everyone was whinging, they lowered the graphic shadow quality or something and in ray tracing shadows. And it they, they then weren't the same values the game launched with. And the whole game just, it, it doesn't handle it very well. They, they leak through walls, they leak through objects. They, they basically broke the game on March 9th. And it's when I stopped playing on PC and uh, moved over to console. But, uh, we won't argue the semantics. Of, con consoles are a better experience. I mean, the, the, the sound on the PlayStation is better. The, the interface with the controller, if you want to use a hand controller, is much better. Um, the light bar will light up your house colors, the, the vibrations, the haptics. I mean, I use a PS5 controller on the PC. It's, it's not the same experience. You just can't. It's, it hasn't got the same subtleties and nuances in vibrational control as you'll find when the same controller is hooked up to the PlayStation con console. Uh, there's also a speaker in the controller, which um, when you're in surround sound mode, that the sense of your spell is actually coming from your hands because you can hear the spell effect like right in front of you, or actually from your hand. You know, and I run Atmos, Atmos, and the new PlayStation firmware allows the Tempest audio engine to upmix into Atmos, uh, which is fantastic. And uh, yeah, look, you, is the PlayStation experience fantastic for, for the paltry amount of money uh, that the console costs? Yeah, sure. But People watching this video are probably more interested in PCs and probably more interested in tuning AMD graphics cards. Uh, so look some context. Have I just talked up the PlayStation 5 console? Yes, I have. Do I think it's much better than an Xbox Series X? As, as an engineer and a technician, yes, ab absolutely. And this is speaking to someone who understands the chips that are in these devices and has been servicing the PC industry since pretty much the late 80s, but certainly since, since the 90s. Um, look, do... do I think I would let an Xbox product in my house. No, I would not, um, because I, I care about the gaming industry. We really should be buying Nintendo and um, Sony if, if we feel to go that way. But uh, you know, that's opinions. It's pretty subjective. Um, objectively speaking, though, the the power supply in my computer is worth more than an Xbox. The motherboard in my computer is worth more than an Xbox. Right? My video card is worth quite a few Xbox Series Xs stacked on my shelf. Right. I can run a $500 sound card in my PC if I so choose. I've got a couple of them in the house. At the moment, I'm not. I just use external USB devices. Sure, we can, we can argue that you can, the sky's the limit on the PC, and you, you can throw a lot of money at it. Oh, my Lord, you speak this up. Like, like two days ago, I had um, 16 times the cost of a Nintendo Switch in um, headphones and a, and a little USB DAC I had plugged into it, essentially. It was uh, using an Astral and Kern music player. Um, but the... 16 times more than the cost of the switch just in the sound I was getting out of the switch. Right? Yeah, we, we can all have luxurious gaming, right? If cost is no expense, right? It, it probably you're not running an AMD graphics card. You're, you're probably so silly as to be paying through the nose for that NVIDIA performance benefit, right? There's no performance benefit. NVIDIA just wait till AMD launch their new cards, wait a couple of weeks, overclock their cards to whatever, and then sell them. They're always magically 10% quicker. Uh, but the amount of money you pay for that extra 10% isn't isn't worth it. And if you save 30% on the AMD card and you can buy an upgrade, you know, much more frequently, you're actually going to wind up with a much better system. Plus, you're supporting the more ethical players in the industry that aren't um, gimping the entire industry. Uh, yeah, and, and NVIDIA. Look, there's a reason why that ray tracing requires the latest $3,000 video card to um, to render at 60 frames a second with the, the graphics turned up. Like, yeah, it's targeted. It's a little black box is that ray tracing. NVIDIA choose numbers that hurt the competition. I don't care if it hurts their own cards, right? They're, they're, they're literally costing all gamers the quality of immersion and, and enjoyment in their, in their machines, but that allows them to sell new video cards, right? That's good. So let, let's just forget about NVIDIA. They are no relevance to us as an ethical consumer. They're worthless. But I'm sorry if I'm annoying you. you. You might be sticking through this video on the basis that I'm gonna talk about the Asus ROG and tuning a Z1. And the only reason you're willing to put up with an AMD chipset is that there's no NVIDIA chipsets in little portable, you know, handheld players. And you're like, oh, these damn AMD chipsets. I hate them. I hate them. I hate them. Yeah, okay, well, that's, that's your choice. Sorry. You've probably moved on. My video's not for you. <laughs> I'm a fan of companies that are pro-consumer. Uh, and, and look, I've bought the, the major video cards from both manufacturers. I've well, got five different video card manufacturers going back to the early 90s. 
the Sing 6100s or the back then it was a 2D game and then once the 2D game was maxed out it was your Matrixes and your Millenniums and your Parnalias and you know Apocalypse 5D if you're going to play with Power VR2 technology and, and OpenGLs with your um, Voodoo's I think I had a system with four video cards in it that was running uh, Windows 98 mind you but I, when I upgraded to Windows XP it was probably a little bit better it was a dual CPU was it two Pentium 2s physical Pentium 2s on a board two of them and um, I think I had a, a Matrox as my 2D desktop card because the quality of the, the graphics output and the colour was just fantastic. And then it would bounce out through a feedback cable into an Apocalypse 5D, which was um, power VR as well as a really good quality 2D um, or desktop graphics chipset. Because I'd like my multi monitors and having my ICQ running on the monitor off to my right. Um, and then I had two Voodoo 2s for their glide mode <laughs> if I wanted to run graphics that way yeah look you can do whatever I've, I've run multi GPU setups until uh, just recently and uh, basically a couple of years ago the market just worked against it went to bury the feature and all, all the major games got re-released with um, one graphical feature in them that just wouldn't work in SLI mode create flickering and uh, so Dragon Age Origins was still pretty good Battlefield 5 broke it it was a flicker um, Skyrim when it got redone the anniversary version I think um, the clouds on the map screen would be a flicker um, you know, it was, just, it was an added graphical effect that just, just bombed out the ability to run two graphics cards. So that's a shame. Could come back. Could could come back in a, in a major way if, if the industry went that way. But yeah, you know, you can't, can't do that. You give too much power to consumers to stay on last-gen products and get life out of their products and not constantly buy new products. So we, we lost dual card gaming. Yeah, it was pretty good. But now, now you just buy the best you can get and brute force it. So... Is 4K 60 practical? Well, absolutely not. I mean, I've already said I'm running this game 25% below 4K. I'm running at what we consider 30 frames a second. It is not quick enough. Most people say you need 60. Now I run 30. I run no FSR or DLSS, which would add latency. FSR 2 adds latency. FSR 1 doesn't. I actually quite enjoy FSR 1, but I don't need to. I can just brute force the game. Um, if, if you add the latency of these frame generation techniques and tools, I actually felt the game was less responsive at 60 frames a second than it was responsive at 30 frames a second. Like this is, and wherever I move, right, that it moves instantly and it moves quick, right? So, yeah, I I just find that, the, that I, I couldn't game at 30 frames a second if I was on a wireless controller. The, the wireless controller latency would be too much for me. But gaming at... 30 frames a second on a mouse, in this case a trackball, is instantaneous. Uh, I'm using a wireless trackball. If I pair it, it's a Logitech trackball. If I pair it with the Logitech receiver it comes with, it's 12 milliseconds of latency. If I pair it to a generic Bluetooth receiver, it's 18 milliseconds of latency. Uh, now that can, that can add up to almost adding a frame of delay depending on your setup and your frame rate. But uh, yeah, look, I encourage game it, whatever the game requires. You know, a game. If I want a pretty game, it's, a, it's an open world RPG, for example. Um, I'm probably going to. Oh, what, what am I going to want? I mean, it's, I, I've gamed on Skyrim on a projector screen off a crappy laptop, and just maxed out the graphic settings and just set it to 720 res. And in the forest out near Rifton, it would drop down to like 24 frames a second in a worst case scenario. But basically, it didn't matter where I went in the game, I could sit north 30 frames a second. Uh, and for you know, dungeons I'd sit at 60, no worries, but but open world areas where it was difficult to render. And just seeing the game at all, looking that pretty, man, that, that just made my mind go, eh, and feel good. So, yeah, do, do whatever works for you. Okay, now let's just have a look at some other games. I think I'll have Greedfall on this list somewhere. Yeah, alphabetical, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Oh, no, it should be there, Greedfall, not seeing it. Okay, let's run something else. I think I've got Skyrim there ready to roll. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly duck into options because I think you'll find I'm running at 3200 resolution, not 4K. I know I've already covered it there. Um, okay, so, you know, is, is Skyrim, a 10 year old open world game, doable at 4K resolution? Yeah, I'd <laughs> like to think it is. Certainly it is. Um, the Witcher with RTX on? No. You know, Hogwarts with RTX on? No. Any, any of these titles with RTX on? No. But 
do I want ray tracing and, and am I willing to sacrifice a little bit of frame rate in a game if I can have a prettier game? Uh, depending on the game, yeah, absolutely. If I can't feel 30 frame rate, 30 frames a second is holding me back, I'll tune for it, or 40 frames or 50 frames. But uh, look, I, I won't deny as, as a gamer in the 90s, I, I was a quick jumper to, to high refresh rate monitors. If it's less than 85 hertz at 1200 by 1080, I'd do it 1024, I wouldn't touch it. Uh, generally, I had monitors that could do 120 to up to 200 hertz. I had a $5,000 Sony monitor that could do 200 hertz in the 90s. It's ridiculous. Um, it's quite good for gaming, though. So, look, if I was to run from White Run up to oh, we've got River, River Vale, Riverton, River. Oh, oh my gosh, that's a suburb next to. Uh, look, I, I'm getting confused with real life and gaming world. It's a bit crazy. So look, if I zoom out and put more detail on the camera on the screen, oh, okay, I haven't got my Steam frame rate counter up in the corner and the beta drivers I'm running don't allow the frame rate counter to run. Um, but I, I ran this this morning and just, just did a little run up to the, the town there. There's a couple of jerky moments at bits where the game does load or cache in the next zone. Uh, if you go crazy with the U-grids, you can have a lot of this world active in your memory over huge distances, hence why I, I can, I'll can i leave the computer running overnight in the White Run Valley because of all the grass. Uh, it's one of the areas that, that's good for checking stability of a machine if you want to leave it running overnight. Uh, but yeah, look, it's true that there's nothing I can really do without that Steam frame counter up. You know, we're not really achieving anything by being here in game. Um, but Greedfall would have been a, a good example. And I'll just, I guess I'll find it via Steam. Here we go, Greedfall. Okay, so this one here is instant sections. So it's not fully open world, which means generally those games can get away. Open world is very hard to do. Uh, open world at 4K at 60 in, in, and, and stable, that, that can be a, a real benchmark to hit. And for anyone out there that doesn't think Hogwarts Legacy is amazing, right? go, go look at Kingdom Come Deliverance and look at a picket fence. Right? It's got a more amazing picket fence than any other game you will have seen prior to that. And then you go and look at picket fences in Hogwarts and you'll see that, that yeah, Kingdom Come Deliverance looks janky <laughs> by comparison. And Kingdom Come Deliverance was one of those amazing games that when you got it, you were just happy running it at 1080 resolution with the settings cranked. All right, so open world game. Uh, again, I think you'll find all, all settings are set to pretty much max. I think, so I think this one is just set to max. But I, I run different graphics profiles for different games. So the, the settings I need to run in this game are very different to what I would run in Hogwarts, which is different to what I'd run in Skyrim. And so something like The Witcher might need me to, uh, with, with ray tracing, might need me to uh, have different voltages running through the chip in order to sustain some of the crazy math that's going on. Um, now, this talking general, general notion of how to make a console or a handheld or a PC get the most out of its video chip is keeping everything in its thermal zones where you get the best use of every watt that you put into it, right? So what will happen is eventually as you overclock, and I'll just use some easy numbers. If one watt gets you an extra frame, right, these are bullshit numbers, but if, if every time you, you add an extra watt of power into your video card, and if for whatever reason your video card being able to make use of that extra watt, because you're overclocking and you're actually making, you're trying to make use of that extra watt, if you can get an extra frame for every watt you put into it, right? Again, bullshit numbers. These would never happen in the real world. Um, at some point, you're going to add a watt and you're not going to see another frame go in. You might have to add another watt and a half or two watts of power. And then you get that extra frame, right? So what's now happening? And if you looked at the thermals on your video card, at that point you would find you're actually running at quite a warm zone and it becomes less effective for the power that's going into the chip. It actually requires more power to achieve the same. That there is the cutoff, right? When we overclock, we don't want that. Now you can say you want that. Yeah, and if, if, if you're 10% below being able to run the ultimate game at the frame rate you want to run it at, right? It's running at 27 frames a second, it's running at uh, 50, 57 frames a second, 56 frames a second or something. And you're 10% shy thereabouts and you think, hey, through overclocking, I can get myself 10% more, right? Probably worthwhile, possibly worthwhile. But overclocking isn't the magic solution that we generally want it to be. And certainly with regard to modern overclocking of AMD chipsets for the last four or five generations, we really want to undervolt them. We want to make them use less power 
and then find out how much quicker we can run them before they start getting really hot. And that's how we overclock. And so I'm good for, I've got about 20% uptick at the moment uh, in my actual frame rates and benchmark numbers because of the overclocks I'm currently running. So that, that means overclocking might be worthwhile. And everyone's got different goals. I, I tune for a quiet computer. All right, my fan right now is less than 900 RPMs. The fan on this video card, I mean, it's nanite coated ball bearings. They've got crazy little, um, <laughs> to create turbulence of, of, as the air flows over the fan blades. They've, they've come up with all sorts of crazy um, print designs for the blades. It's a pretty high tech card, but yeah, it's worth about as much as my car. Oh, no, it isn't. I guess <laughs> my car's currently not registered, so yeah, it's probably worth about as much as my car. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's way too much money. People don't want to spend several thousand dollars on a video card. And they shouldn't need to. Um, so look, I mean, this is, this is such a pretty game. So this is great for. Um, now the reason why I bring this game up is this is a game that will run at 4K on the consoles. 4K at about 30, I think, is what they target. It looks okay. Um, I've put a lot more hours into the console version than I have the PC version. But since I got this graphics card in January, of course, I wanted to come back and, and see Greedfall with all the view distances cranked up and all the things that the console just can't quite do. In order, that, that's a sacrifice they have to make in order to make the console hit 4K at uh, 60 frames a second. Or 4K at 30, 30 frames a second, I think, in this case. Um, and this is why a lot of console games, they, they have a, perform, a, a quality mode which will target a BS resolution that the console can't really do, 4K. And then they'll have a performance mode, which will be like, look, man, when, when we the developers actually tweaked this game, this vision that we've got to give you, and we want it to be entertaining, we actually found that if, if you weren't chasing impossible to get numbers, this is what we can actually do, right? And that's the mode where they're, they're willing to drop the resolution down to whatever it takes to make their game look pretty and actually run the view distances and all the graphical effects the way they want to run them, right? So Gridfall is, is a good example of a game because it's instance, not a fully open world, where you can hit some some pretty big frame rates. I mean, Dragon's Dogma, I'm going to be able to spit that out at 60 frames a second, easy peasy, you know. Um, Bard's Tale, now yeah, look, that uh, not ideal. Look, Kingdom Come Deliverance, this is a good one. Let's do the old Kingdom Come. Okay, so this game is gorgeous, and and it's when people say that Hogwarts doesn't look good, right? You're going to come back and you're going to find the other open world RPGs that have come out in a few years, right? And so we can discount. Cyberpunk, right, for starters. Cyberpunk, all the buildings, right? So this is the difference between organic open worlds. You remember, everything on computers are rendered by triangles. Organic open worlds require a lot of triangles to make objects look round or curved like a tree would look. And then you get um, city structures, which are generally made up of buildings. And buildings just through architectural, just, just through the knowledge and architecture, which is the strength of a triangle is fantastic. Buildings actually are really easy to render out of triangles. This is the difference why Crisis 1, written for PCs, was an organic environment. But for Crisis 2, where they wanted to sell it on consoles, they went with buildings, didn't they? Because it only takes two triangles to render a side of a building, right? It takes a lot of triangles to render the edge of a tree. And so when people are comparing products, we need to compare that things are equal, right? So first of all, let's just have a quick look at the settings. I like this screen because it runs the game flat out. And um, you can actually, it, it's good for testing your thermals and whatnot. But if we go into advanced graphic settings, right, so we've got everything set to ultra high, any aliasing off, but when I come to tuning, we'll talk about that. Uh, everything maxed out in terms of view distances. Um, and I think that was it, graphic settings. Oh yeah, just put a bing. Um, okay, so no, I have dropped the resolution. There we go, 3000 by 1700. So that is what I needed to do because in a field, in a couple of areas in the game where I could look out, I could hit 60, but I wanted stable 60. I wanted stable 60 with a, with a cool machine. So I was willing to sacrifice a little bit. Now I say stable 60, it's nonsense because you can always in the game, about, okay, it was still loading, still loading, never normally this messy. But this little shop here in the main, in the first village that you start off with, always drops your frame rate down to 20. Doesn't matter if you've got a several thousand dollar video card, doesn't matter what you got. Ever since the game came out, there's, there's too many triangles in that room. It was clearly the art department 
must have been one of the first rooms they made. They've left a, a, like all the polygons are double sided or something. They've just made a mistake. And um, that one shot, whenever you approach it, you just watch your frame rate burn. But if you, if you go for a bit of a run around town, you now things to take note of in an open world game, grass, grass can be kind of tricky. So the density of the, the grass, right? If you come and look at uh, fences, fences aren't just made up of easy couple of triangles. They're even going for rounded objects. I mean, that's just ridiculous if you look at the actual fence fences. Again, if you compare them up against Skyrim, right that there, that's round, right? So how many polygons is that made up of? Each one of these sections have to be two, two triangles the length of that. So just to render that there, ton of polygons. When just about every other game would go, oh, we'll just make it a, like a rectangular fence paling and knock that number right down. And so there's only so many polygons you can draw on the screen and then you can apply shadows and, and lighting and all sorts of crazy stuff to them. The more you have, the harder the job. Alrighty, so look, I'm, the screen's changing colour because I'm, I'm pushing myself while running. If I take my finger off the shift key and get my breath back. Okay, so generally a view like this I'd be sitting at, this is where I'd be tweaking for my 60 because through the game, this is pretty endemic, this is standard for the view distances you expect. I would normally tilde and go, I think it's E underscore volumetric fog. Metric fog equals one. Okay, on. Right, and that there gives you, well, it was one of the things I pulled out of the game um, towards the end. Uh, when, it, when I was trying to optimize it to run, when it first came out, we didn't get the volumetric fog. Uh, now this time of day, there's not much happening there, but sometimes that, that set of trees there will be obfuscated by mist or fog. Uh, but my computer still has to render it all. <laughs> We're not on a PS5. It's not going, oh, we can't see that. Don't, don't calculate it. No, those, those distant trees on the other side of the alpha values of fog, right? there's a shadowing in there. There's a depth, there's a sense of contrast that I'm getting. So um, yeah, this, this game is running a little bit tattery right now. I'm not really sure why. Oh, it might be because I haven't created a profile. Okay, so let's have a look. And what's going on because my desktop profiles for my graphics card. Um, oh, it's taking a while to close that down. Okay, so for anyone who's still with us in this video, epic, good on you. Look, I hope you've been enjoying me just casually talking. What we're going to do now is we're going to um, change up the pacing a little bit. Okay, so we're now going to talk about things a little bit more technical and actually talk about the numbers and what may or may not matter. Um, okay, so just before we do, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, okay, if you're using an AMD graphics chip, are you running at 10-bit color or HDR? Oh, um, we'll come back to that in a moment, my bad. Uh, okay, so look, I'll just cover it now so I don't forget to say it. Uh, when, when your CPU says, like it would here, it would probably say about 70% loaded. All of those cores there, with where they were running during that game, would have been about 70% of my CPU. But if any one core is absolutely flogged out, and if that core is responsible for your minimum frame rate, even though it'll say your CPU is 70% used, your CPU will be holding back your frame rate. Right? So it is worth just popping into your CPU screen and just making sure when you're running your games that any given core isn't fully, fully, fully pegged. If it is, you might be CPU bottlenecked. So what you're going to do then is you're going to drop your game to really, really low settings. Lowest they'll go, lowest resolution they'll go, and you're going to benchmark test it. You're going to see what frame rate you can get in the tricky areas of the game because that is the best frame rate your CPU is going to allow you to do. And if you can't get the 60 frames a second minimum that you want, or if you can't get the 30 frames a second minimum that you want, I usually use that to set what my minimum is. I found that I couldn't, but my lowest frame rates in Hogwarts would drop down to 35. So I didn't want, 60 alternating to 35, 60 to 35, that was going to be janky and I would have felt that. When I recognised that my lowest frame rates were going to be a little bit north of um, 30 or 40 frames a second, I tuned the entire game experience based on that. So that's the only reason I left the CPU up. I, I kind of jumped to the wrong screen. What I was going to say about housekeeping, and hopefully I'll remember to come back to CPU in just a second. Um, what I wanted to talk about was... Oh, okay, that's... There's no players in front. No, I've got the wrong one. Oh. Yes, my apologies. Okay. What I was going to say is, is that if you are using HDR, if you go into Windows 
and go to the cog for settings. And then the first one here, you're going to find, it's one at the top left, you're going to find your display settings. And once you go into display, come down, I haven't described that very well, generally we'll do better. You just go advanced display settings. You must be able to check here that the bit depth of your screen is correct. I found by default I was running in RGB 444, which is ideal, but I was running in 8-bit mode and dithering, even though my screen is a 10-bit panel. If I dropped to 1080 resolution, I could run at 444, which at proper RGB 444. Um, so, right, I did want to run at 10-bit mode. So just to deal with that, I'm just going to cover the AMD drivers. Um, what you need to do is go down to your home screen. You, you just come here to your display, right? It might be under gaming, my apologies. You won't see these three extra headings if you've already got a game loaded. Um, so just when you're on the desktop, just you come into your AMD drivers. So just uh, find a free spot on the desktop, right click your mouse, choose the top option, which should be AMD drivers. If there isn't a red option there for AMD drivers, that means you're running the Windows drivers. You don't want to be doing that. You want to get a better performance that running proper AMD drivers will allow you. So you just want to go to amd.com, probably be under support, your drivers and downloads. And as long as you download a version that's relevant for the version of Windows you're running, it doesn't matter what video chip you choose. So they only use one driver package. You're just giving them marketing feedback as to what card you've actually got. Just get yourself any modern AMD driver package um, written for your version of Windows and uh, be it 64-bit Win 10 or Win 11 probably. And, uh, and you're up and running. But once you've got your AMD display drivers downloaded and installed, after a reboot, you should be able to move your mouse anywhere on the desktop, right click in that menu that appears. The top option should have a little red logo looking much like that. It should say like AMD display drivers. When you come in, you can then click gaming. There's these top tabs at the top. You'll probably be on home by default. You click on gaming. You click on display and we'll bring up the screen here. All right, if you come down this screen a little bit, you'll see a couple of things. One will be color depth, and one will be pixel format. By changing to a 422 pixel format with, um, is it CMYK? Um, sorry, why is Yep, You've got, at 422, anyway, it's it's not the purity of 444. It's it's the way the picture gets interpreted by the, the output device. Uh, the screen then has to kind of reinterpret it back to RGB, uh, Ghibli. But what we'll find is for an HDMI cable, dropping back to 422 will allow 10-bit color depth. Now there was another option in graphics somewhere that was about enable 10-bit mode, 10-bit pixel format. If you enable that, you won't get HDR. You'll be back to standard dynamic range in Windows. You won't have the option of turning um, HDR on. That there, feedback from AMD to people on the net, I read that on Reddit, they said something like, this is useful for software like Photoshop, um, but not for your gaming. So just come back over to your, your gaming, go over to display, scroll down, you want to set your color depth to, to 10 or 12 bit as your panel is. Uh, if you weren't getting it in the Windows settings screen, and that, that's the, the qualifier here, if you, if you come into to Windows in your settings under system, and click on display, right? When you click on advanced display settings, right? And, and that's going to load up the advanced display settings for whatever screen you've got selected. So if you've got multiple screens, you've got to click on the screen that is your main gaming screen, come down to advanced display settings, and here you should be able to see what bit depth your panel is in. Now, I, I, again, I say that for my panel in particular, it was running at 8 bit plus dithering in RGB 444. So I just forced it uh, over to 422, not using RGB, mind you, and I magically got my 10 bit back. Right? That's a little bit of housekeeping. You might want to do that. It's probably not very relevant to many people watching this video, but uh, I just wanted to make sure we, we covered that. Um, so we've got gaming, right? Uh, Performance, right, so the same thing. If you've downloaded the drivers for your AMD graphics card, you've got a bunch of tabs. If you fire the screen up, you can go over to performance and you've got three new fields here. We've got metrics, which let's just go full screen. 
you can turn on, so if you want to have a look at your GPU memory or your system memory, you can turn on anything you want here. If you want to look at your CPU, you can turn your CPU on. If you, if you don't care about your GPU memory amount, you can remove it from the list. Um, and at, at the moment, mine scrolls just off the page, right? Um, there is a couple here that we want, that I like to look at. I like to see my clock speed and oh, utilization. Sorry, those two I, I need to see together. There's no point seeing utilization if you don't know what clock speed you're running at. If my card down clocks itself to 1600 megahertz and is at 100%, well, that's the same as my clock speed at 3200 megahertz at 50%. Right, so I kind of need to see these two together to actually know what's going on. Power consumption, right? Now, power consumption, if you're trying to make your product work to the absolute best it can work, you are probably going to be wanting to pay attention to what software makes your card heat up to what levels, or what wattage, sorry, as it draws. Temperatures, right? Now, by default, everyone looks at the GPU temperature and they think they're doing fine. We don't need the GPU temperature, right? It's not really relevant to us. The only one we need to look at is hotspot temperature. To get that, you will have to go over under your metrics tracking. You'll have to go into your GPU. You'll have to go hotspot temperature. It will not be on by default. That one is vital. That is the one that will hold back your performance and will set a lot of your limits for what you can actually achieve. So we need that hotspot temperature. Some manufacturers don't give it. It's true, it, it'll happily operate up to about 115 degrees Celsius. Uh, at 110, it just goes hardcore on the throttling. I'm of the belief it goes pretty hardcore on the throttling at about 94 and about 100. Well, sorry, it lightly throttles at about 94 degrees Celsius at about 100 degrees Celsius. You can kind of see that the card's taking evasive maneuvers to try to avoid more heat going in at that point. So at 110, it's within five of the wall, five degrees Celsius of the wall, and it gets pretty protective of that. And so it'll drop, it'll drop your speed. It won't show you the speed being dropped, but the actual effectiveness of the math that, you can, that your video card is doing at that speed, for magic, little, magical little elf, elf gnomish, known reasons only, you'll find that your effectiveness starts dropping off when you hit 110 degrees Celsius. None of these numbers will change, but uh, you won't be achieving the same levels of performance. Now, hang on, how can I say any of this with any level of authority, right? Well, when we come to benchmark testing, you need to have ways to measure what is going on. So in my case, I use uh, performance test. I use it because it's quick, right? You can use whatever you want. Some people like 3D Mark, some people like, you know. If you've got uh, Tomb Raider, I think it's got a benchmark tester built into it. Uh, Dirt Rally has a benchmark tester built into it. Bioshock. Uh, you can do a couple of things there in startup where you can get it to generate um, a, a bit of a benchmark test. But each of these games are relevant, I guess, to the DirectXs that they run in. Uh, when you're testing dirt, it's not pushing your machine in the ways that other games might. Right? When you're testing Bioshock, pretty easy game by today's standards, so probably not a great one to max out your card. Um, but yeah, I find that running running some some tests of sorts, because that's when you can see whether you're actually improving anything, right? So before I downclocked my card, I could not even run this test. By about here, my machine would be just about at the point of rebooting. And that's because my card is factory overclocked because this test pushes it to its absolute max. It was a little bit too much. The company that sold me the card were happy for me to post it back to them. I didn't really want to post it back to them though. So I um, decided to keep it and just tune it a little bit. But you'll see here my hotspot temp with the settings I'm currently running, it should jump up to 110. It should kiss it quite a few times. Um, but the settings I've tuned for, um, we'll have a look at them in a second as to what I've done with my clocks as to what we, what we call this tuning. Um, but in each of these screens here, this will give you a frame rate number. And if you notice worse numbers, irrelevant of if you think your number, you, you've clocked in higher numbers and you think you've tuned everything up, if you then go over to your benchmark suite and rerun it and the numbers are worse, right? It's a fake overclock. It's not the overclock you think it is. And I actually found I was getting my fastest numbers in a lot of this testing, which is kind of equivalent to the ray tracing type tests in terms of where in the diet it's using. Um, so I, I can get that there using the right parameters. I can clear 15,000, but by default it sits about 13,000. 
So my current clocks are totally quiet. Managed to spit that out. And the reason why it's about 900 points lower than what it can be is that I've tuned this. This is my general profile for, for Windows desktop and any games that haven't got their own profiles. This is an optimized profile, but it is designed that it will let the temperature get up to about 110 just for those brief moments. If you remember back to the start of the video when I was in Hogwarts, in Hogsmeade, and I ran and I said, this is a really bad area, but you can see my video card now sitting on 240 watts of power, right? So it's gone up by about 20% on its maximum power usage over what I even allow it to do. That's how inefficient it was running at that moment, but it was just smashing it out. And so that's what I've set it to do. I've, I've set my rig to do so. And when it benchmarks in that benchmark testing software, which wouldn't even run on default settings with my newly tweaked settings, which aren't aiming for the best numbers in that benchmark tweaking software. They're just aiming to run it and not crash. Um, yeah, the, the current numbers aren't the absolute best I can squeeze out of it. If I really wanted to, I could go to tuning and I could actually come up with a profile specific for PassMark that would hit those numbers every time. All right, so why have we got some different numbers here? Why not just run global tuning and use one set of numbers to rule them all? Okay, well, different games need different things. The new version of The Witcher with the ray tracing lighting needs a lot more power in its core than an older game like The Outer Worlds. Or Hogwarts needs a mixture in between, and I'm finding I get better frame rates by changing what things I'm overclocking on it. So I do use a couple of different profiles. And my global profile, here's, here's an example. Oh, I'm... If this is my global profile, don't learn from me. Uh, this isn't. This should be a gaming profile, um, but I'm, I'm using it for global. What you'll find when you first come into the screen is you'll be on default, right? And in order to get any of these things up, you need to click over on custom. You'll probably be sitting there. Click on the little thing saying custom, and then you'll have a whole bunch of things here that you can open up. Um, they'll all be closed by default. All right, so it'll, it'll be over here, and then you'll click on custom, and then these little things here will be viewable. And then if you want to change the timings on your VRAM or your GPU core itself, or if you want to tune how much extra power headroom you'll give the GPU when it's under full load, you can actually then change those things individually. There's a whole separate section for fan tuning. And I'll just eliminate that one from us to look at. I tune for silence. So your fan really should go up to about 100%. When you're benchmark testing, you probably want that. Um, but once you've got all your overclocking sorted out, you might then come in and, and figure out where you can put this fan curve. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you um, Hogwarts by comparison. I've got a totally different fan curve. And that just allows the game for me to stay silent and on top of it. Whereas The Witcher, what are we using here? Okay, well, my generic one there. But that's fine. Neither of these games hit as hard as Hogwarts does. Very hard open world game to run. Okay, so The Witcher, what are some of the differences I've done with? Well, your 1200 millivolts by default here, I'm running up at 1158, whereas my desktop settings will be 1118. All right. Oh no, 1137 for desktop. Okay, yeah, this is my new kick ass desktop. Must be Hogwarts, sorry. Hogwarts is 1118. No, oh, I'm sure I had one that would tune down at 1118. Yeah, okay. In my reboot this morning, I've changed my desktop profile. Um, so I could get my millivolt running as low down as 11.18. It ran in some games perfectly well. There's a lot of people on the net that actually get themselves under a volt here. They're, they're 900 millivolt or some such. Uh, 950, some people are tuned for, and they're really happy with that. We don't know their system. They might have a power supply that's worth twice as much as mine. They might have a, a engineering science board, a motherboard. All, all the power going to their video card, which might be a perfect sample, um, might be absolutely pristine and perfect. All the case fans in their machine might make it so the video card's got a very easy time without having to use its own power to, to make the fans turn, to keep it cool. Right, One person's rig is going to be different to your rig. So an example, my video card has a particular type of Samsung memory in it that runs at 2150 megahertz by default. Uh, even though my factory default memory speed is set to 2000, the same as any other person who's bought the same video card as me, uh, jumping that up north of 2150 is very, very easy to do. Um, free speed, no real cost in power or performance. I could run it up to about 2190, but that bleeding edge of going up from 2170 up to 2190, the power efficiency started becoming less. So that doesn't serve me, doesn't suit me. I don't do that. Um, 
But look what I found regarding PassMart. There's two numbers you need to tune for. One is the number, and there's all different tests. But the reason I like PassMark is that if I want to do a DirectX 10 test, I can't. If I want to do a, a DirectX 9 test, you know, very, very basic, much older titles. Um, oh, it's come full screen. Normally it runs in a window. So I can check each one of them. And all I've got to do is figure out what game title uh, is, is. So if I'm tuning it for an old DirectX 9 game, I might use this test here as a way to check if my changes in clocks are going to maybe aid that game or not. And then once I find out the settings that work with PassMate, I can then go into the game and, and tweak as needed, just a little bit here and there. Um, so look, I find that, that you run PassMate, you run the DirectX or the, the type of test that you're wanting to run. The first test I run is, is the compute test. Uh, I, I do that because that's kind of loading the same areas of the die that your uh, ray tracing and various things might be pushing. Right, so once I get a number there, I can then come back over to this screen, and assuming I'm on the right profile here, um, and I can then change things. And I might give it a bit more voltage, or I might change what's going on, I might change the memory speed, I might change the core speed. That one's kind of important for getting your extra speed. Um, and if that makes a difference for the, for the positive, then, then we win, right? And then, then we fire up the game with the same profile and we make sure it works. And these are the things we're looking at. If the game just drops, first thing you want to do, drop your frequency, right? Just drop it down to some couple hundred megahertz down, drop, run it at 2100, run it at 2000, who cares? If you can't run something, right? It's better to be running it than not running it. So just drop it down. Don't worry about how much we drop it down by. Drop it down to 2000, drop it down to 1850. Drop it down one sixth below what your maximum is, right? It's about fifteen percent. Just drop it, drop it below what you what you should be able to do, and then start your game. Does it work? Right? It still doesn't work. Okay, what's going on? Maybe drop it, drop it down. As I said, to eighteen fifty or something a bit slower. Run your game. Does it work? Oh, it now magically works. Awesome. Turns out your card might have been getting too hot, or might have been having some some power issues, right? So now then what we do is we work towards beating those things, right? We lower our voltage. This is how we overclock AMD chips, right? You need to be able to make them run cooler. If you run these settings by default, there's three overclocks built in. You can overclock your core, you can overclock your VRAM. And when I say core, core on your graphics card, you can overclock your VRAM. And which is that one. Uh, if we got undervolt, oh no, it says under, undervolt, overclock, and uh, overclock core, overclock VRAM. What you want to do is you want to undervolt, right? And it'll get generic, some sort of number. It'll go down from 1200 millivolt. It'll drop down to like 1175. I found my, my machine just about always runs at 1150. Seemed about ideal. At 1151, I was beating. There's one or two games that would drop occasionally. So 1152 or 1153 sort of stabilized that. Um, but then I'm, I'm the kind of person that would, through power tuning was yanking it back so that when, when it hit its headroom, when it, when it was absolutely doing the area of the game that was having a hard time rendering, instead of just getting hotter and hotter and hotter, it would just start to, to chill out and just ease off on those speeds. Um, but I, I don't think that was the ideal way to power tune. A lot of people say aim for 8 to 10%. Uh, it's not at all. Not at all. That's not how it works. And professional tuning takes too long. There's not going to be any internet. Oh, there, there will be. You know, it's a huge place. The professional guides for how to tweak this number and this number in relation to it probably worth watching. Okay, what I do is I down volt it to the point where the software no longer works, and then up volt it. Then the software hopefully works. But if the and, and the case in point of this benchmark software, if the software then runs and you can get better or worse numbers by playing with your power limit, right? That means you're either, if, if, if lowering your power limit gets you better numbers, that means you're probably hitting too much temperature. And that now you're hitting less temperature, you, you, you're staying at higher clocks overall, you're getting better numbers. If raising your power limit ups your numbers, then that means you actually didn't have enough power to run the chip the way it was meant to be running, right? That's one thing for it to, to turn on and say it's running at those speeds, but for those speeds to be effective, you need to check with your benchmark software that the numbers are actually going up or that your frame rate is actually going up. 
Because just because your card says it's running at 2700 megahertz, if it doesn't render one more frame beyond 2300 megahertz, you're not really running at 2700 megahertz. Not, not if your card's fully utilized. If, it, if, it's, if your card's sitting there saying, I'm only utilizing 20% of it, and running it super fast, it's like, oh, we're only using 13% of it. It's like, oh, <laughs> yay. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, if you can't flat out and it's it's you're getting better numbers by giving yourself a bit more power limit, then that means that you might have been choking it a bit here on the millivolts. And finding the relation between these two is where you come up with a, a situation where you're using the least amount of power to get the game running and working. And in the moments when your card really needs more power, you're taking the least amount of power that's needed to get the most amount of performance out of your card. I probably haven't described that very well. You set this one to make sure things are working. You set this one to make sure that, that it's not just working, but that the actual numbers it's outputting are the best that they can be, that they're actually making real world differences. Um, so look, you might say, oh, I just want to use your numbers. Look, you, you can do, but your video card's different to mine. Your thermal solutions are different to mine. I'm the kind of person who, like a couple of weeks back, I changed two fans in my case, that is, the one at the top that was pushing in and the one at the bottom that was or above the video card that was pushing out and I swapped them around and I lost about five degrees of temperature across just about all the internal components. Um, so if you want to get into airflow through your case, there's static, pre oh, you, you look at positive airflow pressures and negatives and if you set it right, you can have it so that every single area of your computer case has cool air cycling through it. You know, or, or you can create just little tunnels where the air specifically comes in here and goes out there and everything in between those two points is cool, but everything around them might be a bit hotter. Um, look, I, I really give a care about my thermals because I like quiet computing and, you know, everyone's a bit different. This stuff doesn't matter if you're playing with a handheld. If you're playing with a handheld, though, you want every bit of your voltage available to you. You probably want to tweak those numbers. Now, once you've got the game, once you've got it stable and working, you might up your maximum frequency. If you find that you up your maximum frequency and your benchmark results go down, right, you probably want to give it a little bit more, like add another percent on the power limit. Now this number is relevant because it's based off this number. If you knock, the amount of times where I knock this down by one or up by one, and then I have to do, kind of do the inverse on this one. Um, because because the power limit is, is choking or working off this voltage here. So if you've just had to knock this voltage up by a couple of points to stabilize some software or to get better numbers, you might find that you can knock your power limit down a point again or a point or two again, and it still just works perfectly well. So why would you do it? Well, you're trying to lower your total power draw. You're trying to lower your total heat because once these things hit temperature, they downclock internally. As I said, 94 degrees Celsius seems to be with this chipset um, where the first of the, the speed performances kind of cut down and the, and the fans really start to kick in. Somewhere at 100 watts, we sort of see the same again, but at 110, sorry, not 100 watts, 100 degrees. At 110 degrees, it's a pretty big cut, cut off. It, it, it just goes, no man, we've, we've really got to not hit 115 degrees. And it'll it'll fight desperately. So it'll, it'll internally, even though it'll say it's still doing a high frequency, it really won't be. And that's where you'll see the biggest gains in your synthetic benchmarks, where you think you're doing 2400 megahertz, but then you run it a little bit lower, and all of a sudden you get a better frame rate. You're like, what? That doesn't make sense. And it, it just that's how your overclocking works. The cooler you're running it, the more it's likely to hit the top speed and stay at it. And I've had quite a few games where by knocking this down, I'm getting much higher frame rates. Certainly my 1% lows or my low frame rates, which is the ones that actually matter. Um, so don't be afraid to clock something down in order to get more speed. It might seem counterintuitive, but especially if, if you're running where every watt of power and your thermal envelopes are very limited, i.e. if it's portable handheld gaming, you want to make that wattage very effective for you. And that's what I get back to, I might have mentioned earlier in this video with the, the Z1, the new Extreme chipset and the Asus ROG little portable handheld. It is a high number of cores, CPU. If we can drop another one of those cores, you probably won't lose any minimum frame rate. But making that much more 
wattage available to your video card part and allowing your video card part to really make use of that extra headroom, that extra power headroom, you'll probably smash out much, much higher frame rates. So look, I haven't got one to tune with, but I do understand how the chips work. Uh, look, if, if anyone watching my channel shows interest for tuning, I, I think the ROG is the one to beat at the moment because there's not really any of the 7 Series chipsets out. I think only two devices with the 7 Series chipsets out. Um, and they're the ones that are a lot more interesting to tune because of, you know, it really comes down to cutting down your cores and trying to get your video card running quicker. Now, look, I don't know if I've covered everything in this video. When you're tuning a game, right, these are some old school rules. These go back to the 90s. Right. Back then, monitors didn't have to run at native resolution. Right. They were cathode ray tubes. Whatever resolution you set them to was how many pixel picture elements it was trying to draw to the screen. And you changed it to suit the game. Right. So if a new cutting edge game came out, you weren't going to run it at the same high res as all your older games. And we learnt bit by bit to, churn, to turn the resolution down to keep the frame rate up. Right. So in your game, if you can go into your game and if you can turn all the graphics to max and your video card's not fully used, right, that means you've got power to burn, things to turn up then. These are the luxuries you don't need up. You start increasing the resolution. Anti-aliasing is essentially like increasing the resolution. It's pretending to draw a picture that's much bigger and then kind of shrink it down to the screen. Now that's not entirely true. Anti-aliasing is sort of doing that, but there's some smart computational methods where it kind of only half asses the anti-aliasing. True anti-aliasing, the way I've just described it, is, is the super sampling or the super resolution. And uh, I mean, I, I first used that when I was running into a plasma TV. It was a lowly 1080 resolution, but I would super sample elite up to like 4K resolution and then allow my plasma to, and it, it did look a little bit better. You know, it certainly looked, it was like the, best version of anti-aliasing you're ever going to run. But if you're super resolutioning it to like high res, you probably don't need anti-aliasing. If you're already running at 4K resolution, you probably don't need anti-aliasing. Basically, if you can't see pixels on edges of in-game items, right, you don't need to turn up your anti-aliasing. Turn it off, right? Just, just get rid of it. Don't need it, right? These are the things you turn up when you've got power to burn, right? And because nobody's in this situation, Right, or a few people maybe. Generally, what we want to do is we want to look at the things to turn down, right? These are the things that will get you a little bit more frame rate. So the video card is probably most responsible for your frames to the screen. It's not entirely true. Your CPU, I remember if earlier in this video I said, start your game, set all the settings to super low, set the resolution to the lowest it'll go and then run around in your game or run your benchmark. And whatever frame rate it generates, that's the most frames per second your CPU can draw if the world was basic, right? Now, if that frame rate isn't good enough for you, it might be, you, you might have issues that you might want to look at upgrading your CPU or something, right? Or, or maybe overclocking your CPU. I'm, I'm running a gigahertz overclock on my CPU, but I, I change that speed depending on the game if it gives me any extra frame rate. I can actually run it about five gigahertz. I choose not to. I run at 4.4 gigahertz because to, and, and I'm, I'm actually undervolting at that point. I'm actually putting less voltage into my CPU than Intel want me to put into my CPU by specification. Um, but if I if I want to run at 4.5 or 4.6, I can pretty much do that at, at stock voltages. Um, to hit the difference between 4.6 and 4.8 gigahertz for me is, is I actually start having to put voltage into my CPU. It starts getting hot. Um, but if it doesn't give me an extra frame rate, right, if the only game I was getting extra frame rate in was Forza Horizon 3, right, because it's encoded so badly to make consoles look like they're powerful versus PCs, right, it's atrocious. Um, yeah, it, it was like one game that would actually benefit from running at higher higher um, speed on my on my CPU. But most games won't, right? Most, most games in the modern world, I'm, I'm using a nearly 10-year-old CPU. Um, and it was the it was the lowest powered in the lineup. It was 3.3 gigahertz. Um, it was the lowest the little baby in the lineup. Um, so yeah, I've I've overclocked. I, I haven't really got anything to lose, have I? If, if my 10 year old PC <laughs> stops working because I've I've tried overclocking the CPU, you know, I've put too much voltage into it. I've, I've burnt it out. Well, okay, it was around for 10 years. Good, good on it. Okay. Um, but yeah, look, I 
as I say, I, I run less voltage into my CPU and I, I, I take whatever free speed I can take, which is up to 4.4 gigahertz. Um, and so, yeah, there, there is stuff that is relevant to the CPU. We'll talk about that in a second. Mostly though, assuming that you've, you, your frame rate's actually a lot lower than what your maximum frame rate is capable by your CPU, right? That means you've turned things up, right? If you've turned your settings up, now ray tracing is the big one, of course. Um, you, you really want to get rid of your, your ray tracing. I mean, that's that's the, the first and foremost. There's probably nothing as important as ray tracing. To lose, you probably double your frame rates just about instantly. Not true in all games. Um, I think uh, the Quake engine or Doom is, is very efficient with its ray tracing. But if you run any of the um, Portal RTX, Quake 2 RTX, um, Descent, I think it's coming out the last week. We've got Descent by RTX. Uh, like in those games, I have to run them at 1280 by 720 res to get high frame rates. Um, absolutely love them. Uh, you know, if you want ray tracing, go for it. But it's probably the thing that's going to give you the most amount of frames back if you turn it off. Shadows can be a big one. Now, effects is what they're called in, say, Hogwarts. Generally, it's refer to particles. Um, is, is, these are things that are basically being done by your GPU. Foliage, because it adds lots of triangles. Right? If you're playing a game in nature and you find it's your jungle areas that you're having the hardest time with, right? Yeah, don't be afraid to drop your foliage. But um, basically, shadows and foliage should get you more or less out of trouble. Uh, changing your volumetric fogs and clouds probably won't make any difference to your in-game world and in immersion um, in noticeable ways. Usually just dropping them down one notch might get you an extra 4% or 6% or something. Then go for it. You know, just do it. Don't even, don't even bat an eyelid. But um, some people might say volumetric fog and cloud. Now, they're partly on your CPU. That's kind of true. Let's scroll down a bit. CPU. So traditionally, your CPU was responsible for your motion blur and your volumetrics. Um, maybe not lighting clouds, I should say there, maybe. Um, but post-processing used to be in the realm of the CPU. So when I looked in at Hogwarts, what they had under post-processing is they said it's going to affect your GPU the most. And they actually had a separate section um, elsewhere where they listed motion blur. And motion blur is typically performed on your CPU. Going back to Descent 3, they used the SSE, the special instruction set in the Intel Pentium 3 chip. And if you had an SSE 3 chip, they used those extra instructions that only some users would have. And they would generate frames in between frames, motion blur, um, for people's rigs. And in that sort of a scenario, when you're getting motion blur for free and it's not affecting your performance and it is improving the output graphics, it's worth taking. If you're gaming at a low frame rate and you've got lots of headroom to burn on your video card, it's probably worth taking. If you've got a really high frame rate though, you might not need the motion blur. It's sort of something that's come about pretty strong in the 30 frames a second gaming era because um, it does help make things look like they're in motion. But um, whilst I believe motion blur is typically a CPU thing, um, volumetrics yeah, can go either way. Post-processing as listed in some games, whilst it used to be mostly CPU, some post-processing now, certainly in, once I was in Hogwarts, it listed about six things on the post-processing and four of them were like GPU heavy. So you might find it's both. Now, crowd density and view distance. These can actually bog down both. Your view distance is obviously going to increase the number of triangles being drawn on the screen. Your crowd density is the same. But both of these things can increase the calls to your CPU. So I would say CPU and GPU might be these three things. So if, if you're playing your game and your CPU is sitting at 40% and your GPU is sitting at 99%, right? chances are the GPU is limited. If you recall what I was saying, you need to check, you need to jump in here. If your CPU is saying it's at 40%, but one of your cores is flogged out, and if that core is responsible for running that game code and is responsible for the minimum frame rate delivery in that game, then I might just run, up. let me put a game up, eh? Oh, I'll put Skyrim up or something. What have we got? Skyrim, Skyrim's always a good one. Right, so 
if you're running your game and none of your CPU cores are fully flogged out, you should not be CPU bottlenecked. At which point, and if your video card is sitting at 99% usage, what we really want to look at isn't the things that are going to ease up on your CPU. We want to look at the things that are going to burn through your GPU. Hang on, I think current doing something in the background. Okay, so it should technically be up, should now be running, I'm guessing in the back. Oh yeah, there it is. Let me just get this game running. The, the reason I'm, oh, might be having a hard time because that's up. Okay, so, kadoom, Um Anyone out there who can count how long it takes for Skyrim to load and then looks at my rig and goes, nah, it's taking a long time. I am running open cities. I am running large U-grids. It is loading a lot of the game world that the typical Skyrim player might not be loading. After my initial load, I don't have any issues. But, yeah, everyone's got a different version of Skyrim to, to experience. Uh, it is fair to say that a, a, a ninja PC that puts the effort in on Skyrim, you can really push a lot harder than what the consoles are doing. Right? And the consoles, this is a game that they can just about run at 4K60. And... When people say, oh yeah, consoles can do 4K60, no, no. You gotta look at a game like Forza that's highly customized to do exactly that, where they'll they'll limit the size of the track size objects, they'll limit the size of the, the world until it until the game is bottlenecking at 4K60. And this is what we talk about when we say oh, consoles can be optimized to punch above their weight. Um, they can actually do a lot more because when we design for the suspension disbelief being around there, the power levels that they've got, we just keep them loaded 100%. Right. Whereas the PC, because there's so many different builds of PCs out there and no two are the same, developers can't optimise for whatever set of hardware is in the PC world. And so you'll never find that to the metal level of performance that you quite get from the consoles, um, which is where they prove to be exceptionally good value for money. But as you just saw, I just sort of ran in, into the city here. The, the reason I did that um, was for a reason. But uh, look, as we can see, none of my CPU cores are fully looked out. We can see that this one here is responsible for the lion's share of the game. And being an older game, generally four cores is what they were aiming for, maybe with hyper-threading. So you might see up to eight cores that are being loaded. Um, but it's true that most games are going to put the lion's share of the work on a couple of cores. And because this is nowhere near 100%, I would safely take an assumption I am not CPU bottlenecked. It doesn't matter how much quicker I make my CPU run, I'm not going to see any extra frames in the game, especially when I set it to low resolution, low settings, and just, just run it as quick as I can. If I can't get any more frames per second, then there's no point upping your CPU any further. Um, anyway, let's scroll down a bit here. Is your VRAM being exceeded? Right, so you're going to lose about 30% of your frame rate. You're going to lose so much frame rate. If your VRAM exceeds um, what you've actually got. So if, 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 you're, if the game is trying to load more into, into the video RAM than what you physically have, wows if that can create bottlenecking. So ray tracing does seem to add a little bit to the VRAM usage. Textures, which I think in Hogwarts is referred to as materials, but you look for something that's going to be along the lines, generally it's called textures. Um, there's no point running ultra textures anymore. Uh, I do believe that the highest level of texture sets must be more so than just resolution. I think they're about the colour depth or colour fidelity of the textures. If you're not running into a 10-bit panel that's HDR10, if you're not going for that level of visual fidelity, right, you probably wouldn't even spot one iota of difference between ultra and high textures. So definitely drop your textures down until you can get on top of that VRAM. Um, and so, yeah, and then... If, you, if your VRAM also needs to be knocked down, you can either lower your resolution, but there's other methods of lowering your resolution, which is the any aliasing or super sampling. So any of those three should lower your, your needs to the VRAM. Um, look, we can talk anisotropic filtering. We can talk the things that make the subtlest of differences. I have had one or two games where I've changed my anisotropic from four to 16 times to just four times because it smoothed out a frame rate low. Like, yeah, look, there's better guides on the net that'll go more into depth. As some basic rules of thumb that have been practical for many decades, they're them. Stick with the things I've mentioned here. If you've got power to burn, you turn your resolution up. If, if everything, if everything's maxed and, and you know you, you're just chunking along and it's not smooth enough, 
turn a few things down. If it's in open areas only, make it your foliage. Um, if your CPU is bottlenecking you, there might be a few things to look at. If your VRAM is bottlenecking you, which hasn't really been an issue up until a few titles came out this year um, for a lot of people, but uh, you know, maybe knock things down a little bit. Uh, apologies for this video being a little bit all over the place. I wanted to cover a few fairly important topics. I did want to cover how to turn that HDR on in your monitor and to just under your gaming tab, under your, as I said, if you're running a game, you wouldn't get access to that. And then I think you've actually got to go here under global and then you can get over to display. But yeah, under your gaming display, right? You might need to set, if, if Windows is showing you that you're not running um, a 10-bit panel, and if it's saying 8-bit plus dithering, and you know your panel's capable of 10-bit, right? If you want to turn that feature on properly, by all means do so. It, it, I'd say it's worth doing. Um, I'm thinking I noticed a lot less banding or, or greater subtleties in color depth when running. There's even Skyrim, which isn't really an HDR title. Uh, Windows is set to sort of up render everything into the, the um, color scheme. Is it DCI that uh, HDR is? It's trying to up match the colors into that, that 1 billion color format rather than 16 million color format. Um, 16 million plus dithering or 1 billion native. Uh, I'd prefer to go possibly 1 billion native, but then arguably when I go 422, am I just forcing the, the screen to interpret back? I don't know. All right, I'm just, I'm sorry, it's been too long. I've got to get off this phone. I've got to get off, I've got to go. Uh, I didn't mean to waste your time. I did want to have a, a fun little old waffle. Uh, but I, I really wanted to show just how hard it is to do 4K 60. Now, tuning these little rogs for low resolution, don't be afraid to set your in-game graphics to lower resolution. Again, if you can't see the pixel edges and it doesn't matter to you, lower that resolution, you'll, you'll up the throughput of what your video card can actually do incredibly. Um, and then just turn up the settings that are absolutely most important to you as a gamer. Um, but you will need to get familiar with your metric screens. You do want to learn how to use some testing software to find out what your card is capable of and get feedback on the changes that you're making in your tunings as to whether or not you're helping or hindering the performance output that, that you're seeing, right? So if I knock my speed down and then I find that that's my output number there has gone up. That means that this speed here, which I thought I was achieving, I wasn't really achieving because the video card was down clocking itself to try and maintain the temperatures. Right? And I know for a fact right now, if I knock this down and rerun that test, it'll, it'll pass it. So, oh, sorry. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I can't see. From where I'm sitting, I can't see. Probably knocked that down way too much. Uh, but I'll let this just run out the rest of the video. I might better close down Skyrim or it won't happily run. Um, all right. And I say thank you for being with me today. Okay. Oh, I missed it. Hang on, we want those metrics. Yeah, so not quite peaking at 110. I might have taken this down a little bit too far. But uh, it's a bit weird that I will have knocked the speed down. It'll be interesting to see how close in number we achieve. If, if anything, we might even surpass it. And, and my awareness is, because, because I can't see the number I chose, but if I knocked it down by 40 megahertz, I would have gained about 900 points on that test. Um, and that's that's one of those counterintuitive moments where it's like, what do you mean you set a lower clock speed and you got a massively faster frame rate? Now you must remember that 13,000 was my default. 15,000 is what I can tune it to. So you can easily get, oh, no, I knocked it down massively. Um, but again, I, as I said, I, I couldn't even see what numbers I was, I was running. Um, but yeah, it never hit anywhere near 110 degrees Celsius. So I really should clock it up a bit more. And that's what I would now do. Um, but ideally using a magnifier. Okay, so I think it was set to about 24 or something. 
if I, if I knock it down, I'll just go there, 2351. Uh, turn my magnifier off. And then benchmark again. I did lift the metrics up. Remember, the one we want to keep track of is hotspot temp. If that hits 110, those numbers will not be running. The numbers they claim they're running. Okay. So I say thank you for your time here with me today. Uh, look, I'd, I'd like to discuss any of these things. It doesn't have to be a fatiguing video every time. If, if anyone has any inquiry and wants to place a note to this video, uh, I'll get back to you if that requires making an actual video that covers whatever questions you might have or how to implement a feature or how to tune in a specific case. Uh, but, but any feedback you want to give, by all means. Look, I, I understand the quality of the video footage using a, I think I'm using the free version of my camera app because the full version required putting the camera in compatibility mode. Um, I'll probably have to get some feedback off to the Android developer because I, I preferred the full version. I could, I could up the quality of my Bluetooth connection. It made the microphone a lot better. Uh, but it made the picture quality a lot worse. I probably should have focused on, um, I would say, sound quality when the whole video is about talking. So with any luck, I'm using the full version of the software. Um, but uh, yeah, look, uh, that means it's not in proper HDR then, at which point, ah. So look, I understand that there's a lot of technical things about this video that could be improved if I worked off a script, if I worked through checkpoints and ticked them off as I went along. Um, alrighty, so we got pretty much the same numbers as what we initially had, and I was running it at a lower speed. Right, so at, at this point, I would come down. If, if I'd been running my game, I'd just check to make sure my hotspot there, I was still below 110, right? So I was, so I can still turn up the speed. Oh, what am I doing? I'm getting a bit lost. So my apologies, I'm sitting many, many, many meters back here. Right, so 2351, so now we might try 2370. You can use your keyboard to type this in. All right. Come back over to metrics. Lose. You can leave the magnifier up for this test. Not all tests. Many many things want to be in full screen mode to get their proper benchmarking. I think you'll find that's why I prefer Passmark. Uh, it's just it's an ancient bit of software. I mean, if you if you're worried that your scores in Passmark are much worse than mine or something, don't be. You're just running a newer version of Passmark. The version I'm running. Is, they, they probably weren't even aware of the video card I'm using at the time. So about seven of those scores, if I do a test, I'll be in the 99th percentile. And that's just bullshit because I'm tuning my video card down, right? I'm, instead of hitting 280 watts here like I should be, I'm only tuning 220 watts. And uh, anyone who's just watched me, I've just knocked that up and up and up. But see that there? That there was just kissing 110. So now what I would do... I would save, oh, it might've been up at 110, I wasn't paying attention, apologies. If I come up with a bunch of numbers and I see the hotspot temp just touch 110 and not hover there for more than a second and, and in a complex moment of the game and you can keep rendering that game world but it, it just doesn't really ever kiss 110, I save that profile. And I'll even put the words kiss 110 in, in the description so I know that, okay, that one there, was pushing the thermals to the limit. It was nearly going to hold itself back. Anyone that's been paying attention has just seen me go from a score of 14,100 down to 13,900 to 1450, and now I'm hitting 14,300, right? So I've actually just clocked up, and it's not a significant amount. You know, you wouldn't call it, it's not a couple of percent. You need about a 10% increase to actually notice anything. Uh, but as I say, by default, I couldn't run that benchmark at all. So I, I really noticed it when I could run it. Um, but when I could run it, the first settings I had it for, I was getting about 13,000. And after a lot of tweaking, I can easily, I can bust out 15,000. Um, and uh, again, don't compare your numbers versus mine. Whatever numbers you get on one run, you're comparing them against those numbers in a different run, right? They only matter to you. Uh, and the same as the overclocks and the settings that I'm using pretty much only matter to my card. Now, that being said, I was pretty happy with my global tuning here, but don't make it your global tuning unless you knock your minimum down to 500 um, because that's by default, that just allows you to sit on the desktop and just sit power. Um, when you close down the window between what your lowest and your highest is, you put all seven steps of power knock back to be very, very close to each other, which if you're throttling is great. It won't throttle so badly, but you know, with, with good tuning, you don't have to have your card throttle at all. 
you want it to stay below 110, 110 degrees Celsius in the junction, right? Don't look at your GPU temperature, it's irrelevant. It's your hot spot temperature. That's what we call the junction temp. The hot spot temp is the only one that matters. For, for your long-term gaming, you know, if, I, I generally tune for it to peak up to 102, 103 um, happily, you know, and if I could somehow perfect it and hit up to 108 and then just come back, that'd be great. But uh, I think my current Hogwarts build, it sits at 94. So this is, these are pretty perfect numbers uh, for me, which was 1137 on the voltage. It was plus 6%. Uh, I run my RAM at 2172, but most people, I don't think you can raise that at all if you're just using generic RAM. And it doesn't, it's bandwidth. You're, you're upping the bandwidth on your video card, but if you don't need more RAM bandwidth, then you don't need it. Now, I think ray tracing benefits from RAM bandwidth, but it's, you just down tune that at the moment because chances are you're not running out of your RAM bandwidth. Um, and if it's taking extra voltage, which could be used to actually up your core speed, which will get you more frames a second, there's not necessarily a reason to opportunity ramp. So generally ignore, just leave that one. I did find at around about 2020, 2020, 2040 and 2060 were the three numbers where I could see the power consumption change with 2040 probably being the most interesting to me where it didn't use much extra power and it was netting actual improvements in benchmark results and stuff. Uh, but 2020 was, un was uninspiring. 2060, it was starting to use more power needed in 2040 that the gains weren't um, linear or equally scaling. So somewhere around 2040 was probably the best um, if, if you're not needing to get any extra power going into your VRAM and, and if your card can do it. But um, yeah, so my max frequency, uh, look, I did find I was running around 22, 50, 23. You'll find that it won't quite hit that number. It'll, it'll hit as close to it as it can. So it will be set higher here than what you'll see in the games generally. Um, but a, a difference here of 40 or 50 was the difference of software starting and running or not, like simply not running or running. And then the difference of another 30 or 40 was the difference of whether I was kissing 110 or, you know, and, and sure you can argue, oh, you're kissing 110 degrees, but if you just up your fan speed, that won't happen. And it's like, oh yeah, totally. <laughs> my needs are different to your needs. Okay, I like quiet computing. So I don't, I don't push my card very hard. I sit power. A lot of the time it's hitting 120 watts on the graphics card while I'm gaming flat out at 4K. Um, but again, I've got that variance for it to shoot up to 200, 220 watts if need be to brute force through a section of the game. I'm not using FSR modes. I'm just just raw performance, just just getting the frame rates without the frame delay. Uh, that's my preference. But uh, look, everyone's got a different need. That's the benefit of a personal computer. If you've invested all the money, you know, eight times the cost of a console for performance that might not be double. Um, but you're investing in the hobby of, of a lot of pain and a lot of problems then really treat it like a hobby and learn something. Um, when it comes to overclocking graphics cards, I should have put this proviso right at the start. Don't do it. You're only gonna get 10, 20% performance. You're gonna, you're gonna waste six months of your life maintaining your overclocks, right? You're gonna spend a week overclocking so that a range of your titles can be sorted out and you know the numbers for them, right? You're gonna lose all that time. You're gonna be pulling your hair out whenever there's a problem. Windows as a platform is very unstable. So you won't know if it's your overclock or not. So you're gonna be turning your overclock off and then running it and going, oh, was that stable? And you go, no, it wasn't. Okay, well, it wasn't my overclock that broke it. Okay, it's just bloody Windows then. But um, what you'll find is that you're only gonna get about 10, 20% performance, and most, on a really good overclock. Now, 10, 20% performance, okay? If you're gonna waste at least 10 hours of your life, minimum, mucking around with overclocking, right? Go find yourself a crappy job cleaning toilets or doing the most disgusting thing you can find that earns really good pay. If that means walking up and down the street cleaning out your neighbours, you know, rubbish bins, whatever. Try to find yourself an hourly rate around about 20 bucks an hour, work for 10 hours. Get yourself another $200, buy yourself a better card, right? It'll be 10 or 20% faster, guaranteed. It'll always be 10 or 20 cents faster. You'll never have to pull your hair out doing it. It'll have a higher resale value down the track. You'll feel great as a human being because of all that lovely work you did. And the best thing is that this guide I just gave you is relevant again, because when you've bought the best video card that your family's gonna allow you to buy, and you've gotta make that card work for like several years, it's worth getting to make friends with it. It's worth getting to know where its voltage limits are at to be happy or where its temperatures are. And where, you know, learning that card. If you're gonna develop a relationship with your card, make sure you have bought the best damn card you can buy 
it's going to last you a long time so that the time investment you put into that, tuning it, is worthwhile, right? It's going to be 10 hours of your life, right? It doesn't, it doesn't have to be initially, but down the track, you get a new game. You don't know which of your profiles works with it. You get a whole bunch of testing to do again. You're back in that camp of, you know, clocking off another hour or so towards the project of overclocking. You know, again, 10 hours cleaning bins or doing a disgusting job, put a couple hundred bucks more into buying a much better video card that's going to last you two or three years, hopefully. Um, best investment you can do. Alrighty, so uh, again, for your time, thank you. If anyone got here to the end, hey, please leave a comment. Leave a comment. You win, right? First, right? First on my thread. Whoa, that's worth saying. Post you out at PlayStation 5 just as a thank you. Um, okay, not 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 actual um, rebellious statement there, please. Nobody sue me saying you didn't get your PS5. You've left the comment first in every one of my threads. Oh, great. I just made a new friend. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not in the mood for buying friends in PlayStations. So uh, really quite happy to just put myself in, in servitude at your feet. Uh, I am a PC technician. I've been engineering um, PCs since uh, the early 90s. Uh, I've been servicing computers, I guess, since the late 80s, uh, certainly for myself and family and friends. But uh, by the early 90s, middle 90s, I started up businesses and, and was doing it professionally. Uh, I've been in tech support much of my life doing this sort of stuff. You might hear that my tone of voice Whilst I talk quickly, my tone of voice can often be quite friendly and fun and bouncy. Uh, yeah, I've, I've done this. I've done phone support. I'm more than happy to continue doing it. But uh, I, need a, I need a channel in terms of uh, focus. Like if, if people are going to be coming and watching my videos, they can't just be coming here for Hogwarts Legacy Screensavers, which is the lion's share of my subscribers at the moment. Um, I don't mind doing some techie videos to get people up and running and out of trouble or um, you know, sharing an opinion on various things. But... Uh, until until next week, mate, which might not be again. You might have put me in your permanent block button. That's not the energy I'm going for here, guys. I am going for smiles all around, and I do wish. And I say, guys, I say it as an inclusive statement. I don't say it as a way to say, oh, I mean, technical people are men. You know, right hemisphere braining versus left hemisphere braining. No, 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 no. Women use the whole brain, right? The corpus callosum is wider. They're supercomputers, they're like 64-bit computers to, to men that are running around like 32-bit computers. And I say that because the bus linking the two aspects of the computing die, the corpus callosum, is much, much wider, right? You, if you want to understand anything about video card theory and look at uh, the bus speeds, your, your RAM uh, bus, and to, uh, your, your bandwidth limits based on the, the width of the bus speed that's running through the whole card, man, that bus speed's worth everything, right? And that's what women can take in multiple conversations. And I'm being sexist now in the inverse, really, aren't I? So, again, putting, putting my, myself at the feet of. Um, but uh, look, I, I don't try to have any isms. I do my best to, to strip myself, rob myself of isms. If, uh, if you catch me being some form of ismist, by all means, put it in the notes. I'll endeavour to never, ever, ever offend your sensibilities ever again. Uh, either that or, or you know, I'll unsubscribe you from finding me. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I want to have opinions. No, no seriously, I, I don't want to be confrontational. I uh, <laughs> just want to come and share a laugh, come and share a combo, come and share a coffee, get you up and running. Anyway, it's been fun. You have a great day.